Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God, the psalmist declares. Our days may come to 70 years or 80, if our strength endures. In the midst of them are yet trouble and sorrow, for they pass away quickly and we fly away. Earlier ages struggled to live in light of these creaturely limits as well. In the 16th century, John Calvin commented on this psalm, Psalm 90, saying that human beings show their great stupidity when bound fast to the present state of existence, they proceed in the affairs of life as if they were going to live 2,000 years. Death comes unexpectedly, confounding our presumptuous expectations. Before we discover we are living, we have ceased to live, Luther says on this psalm. Before miracle drugs and respirators, Calvin and Luther observed the denial of death, seeing it as idolatry, presuming that creatures can live like God from everlasting to everlasting. As followers of a crucified and risen Lord, our Easter hope is at the center of our identity. It is not to be minimized, this inbreaking of God's new creation in Christ and our tastes of the new creation by the Spirit. It's what it means to be adopted sons and daughters of God. And yet, as this first note on our outline suggests, we have the task of discerning our Easter hope from other lesser hopes that call to our heart. Indeed, other lesser hopes that can become idols if they are made into ultimate hope. In our cultural context in the West, we have a special set of dangers in our present moment. We have a Western culture which glorifies youth and prioritizes the delay of the aging process, whether it's through liposuction to take off a few pounds or a facelift to take off a few decades. We have moved dying from our congregations and from homes into institutions so that they are often out of sight. And many Christians express a form of Christian hope which talks about the resurrection but often focuses upon the denial of the concrete, earthly, disorienting reality of death. As we explore these questions further, let's begin with a couple snapshots. And then I'll give a couple of broad reflections on what this means for our cultural moment. Snapshot one. A few months ago, I visited a friend who is in his 70s. He is dying. We were at his home. He is in hospice care now. We admired the trees and the birds sitting at the bird feeder in the backyard. We told stories about the past, expressed words of appreciation for each other. We prayed together. We were surrounded by this medical equipment, but it was different than I had expected. I had heard numerous reports about how he was going in the, in the emergency room again and again, and it was not sounding good. He looked weak, but content. My friend said that each time he was going into the emergency room, his body came out more weary and battered from the curative methods that were imposed on him. His condition is degenerative and incurable. And so entering hospice care was a relief for him and his wife, who was in a caretaking role. I've given up fighting, my friend said, but I haven't given up hope. He was glad to be out of the hospital. His mood was bright. He was able to give energy to his family and friends, to reading and reflection, and not just worry about what intrusive treatment was coming next. He is dying, but he's also living this final earthly chapter. For he's a brother in Christ, and his hope is in belonging to the resurrected one. Snapshot two. In the fall of 2012, I was diagnosed with an incurable cancer, a terminal illness. Of course, we all have a terminal condition. 
And that's some of what this lecture seeks to reflect upon in light of God's word. But I've entered into a particular kind of terminal space, that of a cancer journey. As a patient with a wife and young children, a few months after my diagnosis, I wrote um, the following in my care pages, which gives a little window into um, some common, I think, experiences of cancer patients. One challenge of the cancer journey is that of envy. This is common for persons with cancer, especially who are diagnosed with a young, at a young age. For me, the question would just pop into my head, why now rather than three or four decades from now? How can other people my age take for granted their upcoming decades when those years and their possibility is a fog for me? At times, I would look at a person at the cancer center who was 70 or 80 years old and think, why do they get to live that long? What are the chances that I could possibly live that long? In light of this age envy experienced by cancer patients, we face a very real temptation to quantify life's value. The longer the life, the better. So with my diagnosis, the frequent um, lifespan after diagnosis is said to be five to seven years in terms of a median. So when I get together with other cancer patients, um, if somebody says, well, I was diagnosed 10 years ago, there's a gasp in the room. <laughs> and there's, you can almost feel the sort of joy for them and also, why doesn't that happen to other people too? <laughs> we want more time. We want to prolong life. And it can become almost a kind of game to see another birthday and to define abundant life in terms of seeing another birthday rather than whether we are living life in communion with God and others. But let me be clear. This happens to cancer patients because the priority of prolonging life is a core priority of our broader culture as well. We often hear talk of miracle drugs and saving lives. Even in the church, when a person is healed of a serious illness, we often speak of saving the life of this person. But the most dramatic restoration of health that we see today, such as in a resuscitation or a stem cell transplant like I've experienced, is no more than a temporary cure. It is God alone who saves. Indeed, as Amos Young points out, the term for salvation in the, in the New Testament, sozo, entails healing and restoration. But that's fundamentally different from cure. One be, can be cured from an illness without being healed or saved in the New Testament sense. And particularly important for folks like me, one can, be, one can experience the healing of salvation without being cured. It's important that we not conflate these two because the work that doctors do and the work that we do as we pray for one another for curing is important work. It's good work, but it is penultimate work. Death has no cure. We hope in the resurrection, which says that death does not have the final word. In the meantime, the foretastes we have of the new creation are just that, foretastes, not cures for death. This means that whether our bodies right now are healthy and we're running marathons, or whether we are bedridden with illness and pain, we all have the same distance to travel before we experience the final victory over death, namely the resurrection. This final blow to death can be dealt with by God alone. Two diagnostic reflections, briefly, and um, then I'll work into my constructive um, response to this theologically. First, as we can see with um, my first example, 
in our present moment, it can be difficult to discern the hope of resurrection from other hopes. My friend was able to discern that as he moved into hospice care and he gave up on um, fighting but didn't give up on hope. But there are a lot of forces in our contemporary culture which push the opposite direction. And in fact, as I've researched this, I have been quite disturbed <laughs> to see that as Christians and as um, committed people of faith, we are actually more likely to misinterpret, the, I think, some of these final decisions um, than others. So on the handout, um, I point to a study from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in um, Boston, and it was about end-of-life treatment um, for those who have um, cancer and whether they would opt for the most aggressive treatment um, possible. Um, the researcher says, and this isn't really a surprise to doctors, that those who opted for the most aggressive treatment did not have any longer lifespans. Um, there, with our medical you know, system, there are always more things you can do. <laughs> um, however, those who indicated that their approach to coping with cancer was highly religious and you know, spoke much about their faith were four times as likely to seek aggressive end-of-life care than those who were less religious. In this quote, I point to some of the summative part of this study, which gives some of the reasons um, that um, were given in um, interviews for why these um, decisions were made. And it's quite telling, even though it's in the somewhat dry you know, language of an academic journal. It says that religious copers might feel that they are abandoning a spiritual calling as they transition from fighting cancer to accepting the limitations of medicine and preparing for death. These patients might equate a palliative care with giving up on God before he has given up on them. It also, they also say that um, they prefer to take every treatment possible um, because only God knows their time to die. And um, so that is part of it. And also because they value um, life, they think that that involves a value, putting high value on prolonging life. Now, as I mentioned, it is, it is sadly ironic in that um, not only did those who sought aggressive treatments not live longer, but other studies have shown that those who opt for hospice care often live longer <laughs> than those who um, keep asking for aggressive um, treatment. But for our purposes here, Note the way in which committed religious persons are less able to prepare for death than their, their non-religious counterparts. Religious patients felt called to fight the terminal illness rather than accept the limitations of medicine and mortality. Unlike my friend who entered hospice and gave up fighting but didn't give up hope, these religious patients felt they serve God by functionally denying the limits of medicine and mortality. A second diagnostic reflection illuminates the many forces that inform my own response to um, envy and, um, and some of what led to this. And an influential thinker for, for me and giving a sociological and historical account has been um, Atul Gawande, who's a surgeon at Harvard Medical School. And um, his book, Being Mortal, um, explores this. And some of what he explores is the way in which we have a cultural liturgy of death. That's my own term, um, with apologies to James K. A. Smith. Um, but a cultural liturgy of death that has modified and that has um, changed rapidly over the last half century or so. 
he points out that in 1945, most deaths occurred in the home. By 1980s, just 17% did. And even in terms of how he was trained as a clinician and a surgeon, he says there's nothing more threatening to who you think you are than a patient with a problem you can't solve. But this is some of the challenge. Death is unfixable for the surgeon. With the terminal illness, Gawande says, and when treatments just keep on and on and on, death is certain, but the timing isn't. So everyone struggles with this uncertainty, with how and when to accept that the battle is lost. As for last words, they hardly seem to exist anymore. Technology can sustain our organs until we are well past the point of awareness and coherence. Gawande notes the loss that has taken place in the midst of this. He grew up, or his, um, his family of origin is from India, and he talks about his grandfather who lived in their house as he was dying, and members of the family would gradually take part of the caretaking process. But he was treated with great respect and honor, passing on um, wisdom. Um, Gwande notes how in the West there has been a tradition of the art of dying <laughs> and of prayers and confession and a place for the church as a community to walk with the dying in that process. But our cultural liturgy has changed. Now, don't understand, I am not anti-medicine. I probably would not be here today if it was not for medicine. But with medicine, if it becomes our master, it feeds our attempt to cling to life as if the limits to our life are artificial and unreal. In this new cultural liturgy, we've replaced final words to loved one, confession and prayers, to with agonizing family decisions about when to shut off the ventilator. We've replaced the known pastor with the unknown ICU doctor. Rather than admit that before God, our life is like a breath and our days are like a fleeting shadow and that our hope is in Christ, in his resurrection, we keep hoping that a quick medical fix will be around the corner. And as this Dana Pharma Institute study shows, many religious patients act as if even preparing for death is an unforgivable surrender, an unpardonable heresy. Okay. Recovering resurrection hope in scripture in light of some of these dynamics that I point out. Paul says in his, favorite, in his famous chapter on the resurrection, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. If Christ was not raised, Paul says, then our faith is in vain and we are left in our sin. Moreover, if Christ was not raised, we are not raised. But Christ is indeed the first fruits of those who have died. Thus, through Christ, God deals a decisive blow to the final enemy, death, in the resurrection. This conviction about God's victory over death is central to our Christian hope. I, I affirm it unequivocally. But in the light of the forces of our cultural moment, I think it's often misappropriated, whether consciously or not, in how the church approaches death. At times, we see death as an enemy that we are called to defeat. For many who are dying of cancer, or who have died of cancer, they are talked about as fighting cancer to the very end, and that is their crowning virtue, rather than Paul's virtues of faith, hope, and love. At other times, because death is an enemy, we act as if we can suppress and deny its reality. It's ironic, we live in a culture which, which has death pasted all over the newspapers, but paradoxically has removed the concrete experience of dying from our families and faith communities. Even 
when death occurs, our response often reflects this denial. For example, many Christian funerals today collude with the death-denying forces as they completely avoid the language of death and dying for other euphemisms. For many, the body of the dead person is not present at these funerals. It's in turn turned into a one-sided celebration of life of the one who died, complete with color photos, Christian contemporary music, and a hero-making process for the Christian loved one. It's become common to use the word homecoming rather than death, since God has been victorious over death and the loved one is in a better place after all. I mean, death, just saying the word sounds morbid, right? And it's an enemy. Not surprisingly, in this context, many Christians are hot, hesitant to talk about death before it comes, to plan to give space for dying with family and faith communities. Because death is the enemy, and they don't want to give it that space. Ironically, however, I believe that our testimony to resurrection hope is muted in our contemporary moment because of this kind of denial of death. Unlike Jesus and the New Testament authors, we do not approach death with the earthy realism of the Old Testament. Thus, I think that we need to revisit the Old Testament witness of death. As I do so, we're making a hermeneutical choice. I'm not trying to unthink Jesus as I approach the Old Testament, but it's more like this. Did Christ come to fulfill the law and the prophets or to displace them? The Old Testament says things about death that can make us uncomfortable and are not always clear witnesses to resurrection hope, but they do provide the context for that resurrection hope and can lead away from some of the misinterpretation of this um, resurrection passages like I've just been speaking about. So, the Old Testament witness, death as universal and irreversible. The Old Testament gives an unequivocal account, which insists that whatever matters are in human hands, the fact that human creatures die is not one of them. Death is in certain senses, important senses in the Old Testament, irreversible. Certainly, the psalmist frequently testified that death is only ultimately under God's kingly rule. But the most frequent con conclusion to this is that our lives are short and like a breath compared to the Creator. So in the words of Psalm 90, you turn people back to dust, saying, return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day which has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. Yet you sweep away people in the sleep of death. They are like new grass of the morning. In the morning it springs up, but by evening it is dry and withered. Indeed, in the words of Psalm 6, among the dead no one proclaims your name. He asks, who praises you from the grave? From Sheol. Likewise, the preacher in Ecclesiastes declares, whatever your hands finds to do, do it with all your might, for in the realm of the dead where you are going, there's neither working nor planning nor wisdom. Death is universal and irreversible. But what about God's healing and restoration in the Old Testament? The story of Hezekiah's healing in Isaiah 38 gives an important example of how of these same themes um, related to the universality and irreversibility of death, but some, other, some hints of some other themes as well. In Isaiah 38.1, we're told that Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. He is then told to prepare to die. In response, Hezekiah laments in tears and prayers. And God speaks through Isaiah that, I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will add 15 years to your life. What is Hezekiah's response? Well, Hezekiah responds with gratitude, but he also expresses the turmoil which brought him to lament before the Lord. In the prime of my life, must I go through the dates of death and be robbed of the rest of my years, he asks. Now, why did Hezekiah feel that God would have been unjust in robbing him of those years? Well, he says, 
the grave, Sheol, cannot praise you. Death cannot sing your praise. Those who go down to the pit cannot hope for your faithfulness. In this example, we see how Isaiah reflects those earlier views that we saw in the Psalms, or these other views in the Psalms and in Ecclesiastes. But it also provides a seed for another theme, which later becomes a full-fledged resurrection hope in Israelite tradition. Hezekiah has a strong case, feels that he has a strong case in protesting before God, in petitioning before God, because his life would not be characterized by um, many years as with figures such as Abraham, who in Genesis is said to have breathed his last and died a, gold age, a good old age, an old man full of years. So there's something about the death in the middle of life <laughs> that is a particular cause for protest and calling God on his promise. Is this really what your covenant promise looks like? And interestingly, Psalm 102 makes almost the exact sort of um, plea um, like Hezekiah here um, on God, why would you take me away mid-course through my life? So we see a bit of that hope, <laughs> um, but we should not miss the basic point here that Sheol, the realm of the death, dead. In that place, people are no longer living such that they can praise and hope God, hope in God in, this, in these um, Old Testament texts. Next point, a covenant God of life in the Old Testament. Interestingly, alongside this theme of the universality and irreversibility of death in the Old Testament, there's a theme that accompanies it. God is a God of the covenant who prefers life for his people. As John Levinson and Kevin Madigan have shown in recent books, long before a clear witness to the bodily resurrection in the book of Daniel, God's, des excuse me, God's desire for life for his covenant people testifies to a sense that although God is a Lord over both life and death, in the end, death is not a friend to God's purposes but an enemy to be overcome. The roots for this theology are both old and deep in the Old Testament. Levinson and Madigan note that Sheol, as a place of the dead, is a place for ancestors, but unlike many other um, ancient religions, they were not objects of devotion or worship. Rather, the remembrance of Abraham Isaac and Jacob were seen as altogether mortal and fallible human beings whom God had rescued, blessed, and instructed in their lifetimes. Through all of these um, different narratives, such as Joseph, who pre-enacts the experience of the whole people of God when he is enslaved and then freed, just as the Israelites um, will be our freed from slavery in the, in the accidents. There's this theme of God's preferring life for his covenant people. One of the ways in which this shows up is that um, for Abraham and for Job, they experience a partial fulfillment of God's promises actually in progeny um, in their old age. As Levinson says, God can keep his promise to Abraham or his promise to Israel associated with the gift of David, even after Abraham or David as an individual subject has died. So in a strange way, this gift of children, since the covenant prom promise was to the people and to um, their progeny, um, is a foretaste of the resurrection, Levinson says. Levinson is a Jewish um, Old Testament scholar. Since the, con the continued life of the family is a triumph over the forces of death, a vindication against evil. There are um, other examples where they see this foreshadowing of 
a hope of the resurrection and the way in which this fits within God's covenantal promises. I have an example here from 1 Samuel that um, I will um, move over um, for now. But one of the themes that you start to see with it is that um, rather than the place of the dead, um, Sheol, being just a place where all of the dead go, um, you start to see that as um, First Samuel says, the wicked will be silenced in Sheol. So there's a kind of a judgment um, connected to it. So it's not a total static view of, um, of Sheol in the Old Testament. And so then when you come to Daniel 12 and the hope for the resurrection of the dead there, you have all sorts of Old Testament themes that it is building upon in this um, statement of resurrection hope. So in Daniel 12, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So this old theme of God's covenantal preference for life and God's kingship over life and death shows itself not in resuscitation, which would just be a temporary solution, <laughs> or even curing, which would be just a delay and not a solving of the problem of death, but an awakening to everlasting life. So the goal of resurrection here is not prolonging life. It is a new life, a resurrected life um, based upon God's promise and God's rule. And um, the language of God's kingdom is very important here in Daniel as well. In, in Daniel 7, um, it says, then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the rulers will worship and obey him. So God will be victor, and God will be king, and all of the human kings and created order will bow and recognize God's kingship. But ironically, maybe not ironically, but along with that, you have um, human beings being kings and queens themselves as they participate in God's victory as it is handed over um, to the people of the Most High. Now, what I've given so far is far from a comprehensive survey, but it points to aspects of a theology of death that some Christian theologians qu too quickly write off as defunct stages of the history of God's revelatory disclosure. Let me pull together a few points here, both in relation to the contemporary challenges uh, that I gave at the outset of the lecture and in terms of our, of our theology of um, death and resurrection. First, healing and recovery does not confront the problem of death. God's covenantal promise is the only source for resurrection hope. I think it's a category mistake to think that either prayers for healing or modern medicine actually confront the problem of death. In the words of Gawande, his surgeon, mortality is not fixable. As a surgeon, he says, if your problem is fixable, we know just what to do. But if it's not, in his view, the failure of contemporary culture to face the limits of medicine and to face our mortality has caused callousness, he says, in humanity and extraordinary suffering. Likewise, I believe that God is active in the world and God heals, but even the most amazing healing is at best a resuscitation. We tend to paper over these realities in a way that scripture does not. How are we to respond to the unfixable reality of death? Some in our culture today will say, well, let's befriend death and speak of the circle of life of which death is all part of a natural process. Others go with repression. <laughs> we assume that if we don't mention death, it will go away. Maybe it's just something that happens to other people. But as Christians, 
as we sort through resurrection hope in relation to false hopes, I think that we need to come back to the resurrection message of the New Testament in a way that is soaking with the reality of Ecclesiastes, the Psalms, and other biblical witnesses to the loss inherent in death. We often say they're in a better place and seek, um, and sometimes we seek immortality for our loved ones by turning them into heroes. But there's an important sense in the Old and New Testament in which the dead are silenced. We loved them as daughters and sons, wives and husbands, and now they are gone. Thus, particularly in light of our resurrection hope and God's promises, we are freed to join Jesus who wept and grieved over Lazarus, even though he knew that Lazarus was going to breathe again. We can join the psalmists who center their hope in God's covenant promise and God's preference for life and complain that we taste and see dead, death. With Psalm 88, there are times when we lament in grief that I am set apart with the dead, like the one who is slain in the grave whom you remember no more. As a covenant God, God remembers us. And if we believe that, then we need to join the psalmist in lament when that does not seem to be happening in our lives. As I've met others on the cancer journey, I've known families who have lost a child, families who have lost a father, and I've seen in new ways how we need more than a superficial resurrection hope, which just papers over death. It is not reassuring to them. Not only healing and medicine, but even resurrection hope does not solve the problem of death. In God's economy, resurrection is God's victory. It is incredible and good, and we can taste it now. But we should be expecting but we should expect that hoping in God's promise in the dark doesn't make the present wounds of death go away. For the bereaved, even as they hope that their loved ones are with Christ in a place that is very much better than our present life in the mortal body with Paul and Philippians, their loved ones are still silenced for the present, set apart when they eat dinner without them when they go to bed at night without them, when they walk through the park without them. As people who live by God's word, we need to do rejoicing with those who rejoice and grieving with those who grieve and realize that the two will often be the same person. Walking with one another through dying means being attentive to God's lavish, undeserved gifts, every breath we receive. Yet it should also mean admitting that death is both inevitable and in universal, and that it digs a hole in the living, which will not be filled until the final resurrection. Second, we live... <laughs> I have a version that I changed the wording slightly from the outline, so... Um, the scent and smell of resurrection, hope, lament, protest, compassion, and suffering. Somehow in the midst of our search for victorious living, positive, upbeat Christianity, and our mind over matter American optimism, we've cheapened the resurrection hope because we've sentimentalized death. 17th century poet George Herbert gives a refreshing alternative in his poem, The Dawning, which is on your handout. Awake, sad heart, whom sorrow ever drowns. Take up thine eyes, which feed on earth. Unfold thy forehead, gathered into frowns. Thy Savior comes, and with him mirth. Awake, awake. And with a thankful heart, his comforts take but thou dost still lament and pine and cry and feel his death, but not his victory. Arise, sad heart, if thou dost not withstand, Christ's resurrection thine may be. Do not by hanging down break from the hand which as it ariseth raiseth thee. Arise, 
arise. And with his burial linen, dry thine eyes. Christ left his grave clothes that we might, when grief draws tears or blood, not want a handkerchief. We are not pioneers in sorrow and suffering. In Christ, God has shown how the God of the Old Testament, who is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, as Exodus tells us, has displayed his love in the astonishing life, death, and resurrection of the incarnate Lord. But awakening, this awakening from sorrow, which is the term that Daniel uses for resurrection, is partial now. We still lament, pine, and cry, as George Herbert says. But we do so knowing that we are not alone. It is the burial clothes of the risen one which can dry our eyes. We have the scent and smell of resurrection, but we're not fully there yet. Karl Barth notes the way in which death and Sheol in scripture are not static, but death is like a kingdom on the offensive. Citing a wide range of Old Testament references, Bart notes how death has a hand which reaches out. Death cannot be satisfied, but gathers to itself all the nations and heapeth upon itself all the peoples. Death breaks into the present. Indeed, Bart says, the entire book of Job is a description of such an attack of death successfully directed against human beings. The kingdom of God is a different order from the kingdom of death and destruction that is breaking into God's good creation. Thus, as followers of Christ and his reign, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, authorities, against the powers of this dark world, as we say with Ephesians. Christ is king, but his kingdom is not fully established. In the meantime, our struggle against the powers of death and corruption is testimony to the Christ, Christ's lordship. Paul speaks about this um, in Romans 8, where the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth up to the present time. And not only that, it's the spirit who groans inwardly in us as we await our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. So in this way, resurrection itself, or resurrection hope, can become more of an act of protest against the reign of death in this present age than final closure and victorious living. In hope, we declare that Jesus is the Lord, that he will have the final word, not the President of the United States, not the United Nations, not Amazon, not Google, not global capitalism. This hopeful proclamation is protest because we confess that the world is in God's hands and yet presidents, global corporations, and all sorts of things are not the way things are supposed to be. More concretely with dying, we join George Herbert, the psalmist, and most important, Jesus, in lamenting and weeping that a world in which death and decay is breaking in, as Bart notes, is not the way things are supposed to be. We don't act because we feel like we're going to change the world with our action, but we act as a witness and testimony to Christ the King. In spite of the fact that I've noticed nearly every college advertisement in Christianity today seems to be promised to you know, train Christian leaders to change the world, it seems to me that God is the central actor in the renewing of creation. And that setting out to change the world, rather than just witnessing to Christ in the midst of this broken world, can be a recipe for burnout and false hope. A friend of mine illustrated this. He was a um, chaplain at a children's hospital and was counseling a nurse here who worked there for a number of years. At first, working at a children's hospital seemed like a fulfilling act of service for her, but she had been there for years and she was wondering, why do I keep on going in and caring for these children 
all of them have terminal disease. All of them are going to be dead soon. I'm not changing the world. I'm not changing anything in my job, she said. My friend, as chaplain, said to her, keep going in with these daily activities of care as an act of protest that this dark world in which young children die is not the way things are supposed to be. It's an act of protest which is also witness that Jesus is king and that he will have the final word. In the meantime, in prayer and compassion and protest against the present disorder, testify to the coming order of Jesus Christ. Our final main point, salvation and resurrection glory. Hopefully I've been clear that God's work of new creation with Christ's resurrection is the hallmark and fountainhead has profound implications for life here and now. Certainly in some sectors of the Western church today, salvation can be reduced to going to heaven after you die. That is a distortion of the gospel. But interestingly today, I often find a different sort of problem. They've read books from the cottage industry about how salvation is not about just what happens after death, but is about life here and now. Among the finest of these polemics and counterproposals is N.T. Wright and his very influential book, Surprised by Hope. In light of this counter-movement, we're seeing congregations that have a different problem. Recently, I was speaking with a pastor whose congregation um, consists of um, adults in their 20s and 30s. They consider themselves to be very influenced by N.T. Wright's vision of kingdom and similar voices. Then he noted some distress and that something might be wrong, that they had never talked about life after death. Being a homogeneous unit church in a sense, they had never had a funeral. They had never walked with someone through the process of dying. There was a sense in which what they were left with is assuming that the kingdom of God, what we see of the kingdom of God here and now is all there is. How could this happen? Well, it did not happen because that was the teaching of N.T. Wright. It certainly isn't. But I think it happened through a convergence of cultural forces. Institutional and institutionalization and marginalization of death, the growth of homogeneous unit churches, especially among um, in church planting um, circles, targeting particular ages and demographics, which instantly I think moves against the notion of one new humanity in Paul and the idolization of cultural values, such as productivity, change, and innovation. So it's all on our present moment and what we're doing for the kingdom now. Wright's view is much more balanced and nuanced than the functional theology of this congregation. But given the dynamics of our cultural moment, I fear that his proposal can be easily co-opted <laughs> in a particular direction. First. Wright has, trouble, has a troubling tendency to view his own proposal as new and distinct from, as distinct from earlier Christian teaching, feeding into a kind of contemporary, especially American idolatry of the new. Second, emerging from his high doctrine of creation, he gives a high place to human productivity and activity, making that key for his eschatology with the coming together of, of heaven and earth. This is from Wright's um, um, Surprised by Cahote. So far from sitting on harps, or sitting on clouds and playing harps, as people often imagine, the redeemed people of God in the new world will be agents of his love, going out in new ways to accomplish new creative tasks, to celebrate and extend the glory of his love. However one evaluates this vision of the eschaton, the fact that it resonates with the common cultural idols of the West in terms of productivity, adventure, can make it an easily, domesticate, easily domesticated by a youth-oriented culture that wants to deny our mortality. Now, at this point in the lecture, I have to note some thorny theological issues that I can't completely um, pursue here, but they are directly related to Wright's proposal. Theologians such as Thomas Aquinas and in his own, um, 
and in his own distinct way, Karl Barth, deny that the eschaton will be an ongoing succession of events. In light of the infinite beauty and worth of God, they emphasize the biblical vision of worshiping the Lamb of God, the triune God of grace, in a face-to-face -face way that can't be boring, which is what N.T. Wright is worried about. In the words of Matthew Levering on um, Thomas Aquinas, when the material cosmos is transformed into a temple of the Trinity, Aquinas does not think it will look the same. Plants, animals, and so forth will give way to material beauty of another kind, once reproduction and corruption are no more. So it will be material, um, but these bodily movements will gain a share of divine eternity and a subtlety and agility of um, Christ's body. In a different way, Karl Barth makes a case against ongoing succession of time in the new creation by claiming that creatures as creatures are not immortal and that endless succession of creaturely time is a form of idolatry. Thus, Barth sets it up in this way so that the astonishing gift is that we actually share in God's eternity in the resurrection. When humans participate in the resurrection, according to Bart, they come to exist in time in the way that God does, not in the way that, that, that creatures do. When human beings' time and all, shall, all of that shall have passed, Bart says, he will be caught up by the eternal God as the one who exists in his time, not according to his nature, but according to the promise of God. Now, I appreciate the way in which N.T. Wright uncovers the biblical theme of the way in which the coming together of heaven and earth is a restoration of our created goodness, embodied and material and earthy. But I do, and I also have hesitations about aspects of Aquinas' and Bart's proposal. Aquinas, on whether he can adequately explain how the resurrected is connected with the kingdom being handed over to the holy, most holy people of God, as the book of Daniel says. And Bart, whether his decision to say that mortality is constitutive to creator, creaturely existence risks downplaying the goodness of God's creation itself and just saying that death is natural. But as we approach death in our current production-oriented, medicalized context, I think that our current challenge is to see the astonishing glory of the resurrected life and how different it is from all of our best activism, evangelism, social justice, and so on. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians, for this light and momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory that is beyond all comparison. For many Christians today, this glory is not beyond all comparison. It is, on the one hand, an excuse to deny the ravages of death in our world and in our hearts, to save us from the work of lament and compassionate response. But for other Christians, resurrected glory is not beyond all comparison because they assume the kingdom of God is just here and now. Heaven is a place on earth. And that the Christian message is primarily a word to motivate people to go out and make the world a better place. To these, I have a word of despair and hope. <laughs> we cannot transform the world. But we hope in a God of resurrection who promises to do just that. When we clarify that the true nature of resurrection hope is not the ongoing extension of creaturely life or the denial of the profound corruption of death, then by the Spirit we can be empowered to stop fighting when it is time, like my friend who, who went into hospice. And to keep hope, we can be, in, in this light, we can keep lamenting and responding in a world where the kingdom of death seems to move forward, even as we recognize that we are witnesses to King Jesus and not the saviors who claim that they can fix the unfixable problem of death. For God alone, with his covenantal preference for life, can awaken his people to resurrection life in Christ, such that death does not have the final word. Thank you.